Welcome back all to the New Zealand Property Podcast and Video Series sponsored by Property Ventures Real Estate. And today I'm sitting next to Miles Stratford from, uh, in fact, you, you can name the company because it's a, yep. a bigger mouthful than I thought it, it was. It is indeed, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, Met Solutions is the brand that lots of people will be familiar yeah. with. Safe and Healthy Home Solutions is the uh, the company name because we're doing a bit more than meth these days. A bit more than meth, yeah. And the first time we spoke uh, to Miles, this is the second time, I guess we, it was all about meth. Uh, and how it affected and it was brand new sort of to New Zealand as far as real estate yep, goes early, and all the rules days. and regulations. So, um, and if you're wondering where we are, we're just sitting in one of the new apartments here in uh, Alexandra Park, race course in Green Lane in Auckland. Mm. Beautiful view, you can probably see the uh, Blues practicing behind us. So, um, see if they can catch up for the Mighty Crusaders. So, uh, give, anyway. them, give them a few top tips. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, yes, yeah, so we're, we're going to talk today uh, about um, meth testing and how it's changed from when it first came to New Zealand. And when there were a few cowboys out there doing a few cowboy rules, I'll say, yep. and um, to to where it is is now. So I think the good place to start off with Miles will be uh, when uh, talking about what the levels or the levels were, if that's the right the right word, or the, yep. and where Except they are levels. now, and um, yeah, and and what and why it has changed over the time. What's evolved over time? Yeah. So there's there's a little bit of a history. Obviously, yeah, you know, meth's been around for like the last twenty odd years, um, Mark. Yep. We had. Um, because of the growing problem with meth labs in New Zealand back in 2010, Ministry of Health puts together some guidelines um, for uh, decontamination testing around meth labs. Yeah, so the 2010 guidelines um, were built around meth labs and testing and decontamination around meth labs. And what the testing was identifying was lots of properties where uh, the meth related behaviour was limited to use alone. So what was the point of reference for um, that? What yeah. the councils uh, essentially did was because it wasn't covered in the New Zealand guidelines, they looked elsewhere for guidance. And where environmental contaminants are concerned, you tend to first point of call is looking across the ditch. So when you look at the guidelines in Australia, which came out in 2011, again, uh, the title was all around decontamination of meth labs. So within the text of that, um, those guidelines, it talked about the fact that meth from use uh, was also unacceptable, right. and the same process and the same level should be used. Uh, so that's essentially what then became our framework of reference. Now, as more and more testing is being done, um, there's a determination that those levels were uh, considerably too conservative where yeah. use alone had occurred yeah. um, and, and because there was more and more testing going on within the housing New Zealand the costs that were within uh, the government exchequer was uh, was increasing significantly right. um, uh, and so there was a review of that process that was commissioned um, conducted under the standards and accreditation act so independent of the, of the political process um, but commissioned by uh, the then uh, national government so that started in 2016 and led to the production of the New Zealand standard right. in 2017. So, um, the uh, as with all technical standards, uh, there was representation from the people who were delivering services into that space because yep. that's how you kind of get a good process that comes out the back end of it. Uh, but there was widespread representation from property investors, real estate industry, property managers, mm. um, Ministry of Health, Ministry of the Environment, a whole bunch of different people, local yeah. government New Zealand, um, were involved in creation of the, uh, the standard itself. And significantly, the numbers, because it was politically charged, what the Ministry of Health did was commission ESR, so the Crown Research Institute, to go out there and do a full review of whatever literature was available at the time mm. um, to make a determination on what the acceptable level should be and what the numbers should be. Okay. Right. Um, so, again, politically charged, what they did, uh, ESR did, was commission guys over in the US to do that full review. Mm -hmm. um, they came back to the Standards Committee with a, a set of recommendations that, that had different levels based on use and or manufacture, different levels based on whether or not there was carpet in a property, which from a, a pragmatic point of view was never going to work. Mm. So what the Standards Committee did, uh, and there's a, 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 almost a 100% a, a um, people signing up to this was to say, okay, well, let's be pragmatic about this. Let's adopt a level which is consistent with international precedent, um, which was the 1.5 yep. micrograms uh, per 100 centimetres squared as opposed to the 0.5 micrograms. Um, if we've gone down the ESR route, uh, any property that had any meth in at all, because you so can so tell it the just difference. It started at 0.5, didn't it? For so yeah, 100%. So it started at 0.5 in 2010. Yeah. It's still 0.5 in Australia. Yeah. Um, really. It shifted to um, 1.5 because if we'd followed the ESR advice, which was um, uh, 0.5 for manufacture, yeah. because you can't tell 100% uh, with a test whether it's useful manufacture, um, just by doing right. a test alone, yeah. the precautionary principle would say that you then go to the 
lower number yeah. to eliminate the risk. Uh, and so that was never going to work. So the level of 1.5 was established for high use areas, so you're going to need bedrooms and living areas and, and garages, which can be, as we know, converted into uh, living spaces. Mm. But then like a 3.8, yeah. if we're talking about uh, roof spaces and wall cavities and, and underneath the properties, areas where it's a limited use and people go into them. Yeah. So all in line with international precedent. What was really significant about that standard uh, is that it created a framework of reference for the sampling process right. uh, that if the standard is followed leads to much greater consistency. So one of the big issues that was uh, occurring was that you could have two organisations go into a property and come mm. out with two profoundly different set of results. Yeah, I mean, Therefore, you know, confidence in, in, the, uh, in the process um, was undermined uh, and understandably so. Yeah, and it was really uh, confusing. It was confusing for uh, buyers and sellers of property and, and people using it to their advantage, <laughs> one one versus the other. And there yeah. was quite often, I remember, two, two meth tests getting done on some properties of, yeah. you know, five or six years ago. Correct. And, and, and that can still happen. But if you are following the process that's set out in the standard, where at a screening assessment phase, what you're trying to do is rule out the extent of the problem, and you're following the, the framework of reference in the stand, which is you hit high risk, mm -hmm. high affinity surfaces, because if those surfaces, it's not about trying to catch people out, it's yeah. about making sure you don't get caught out, right? Yeah. But if those surfaces don't have a problem, you can have a really high level of confidence that you don't have a problem. Yes. But yeah. if somebody goes and tests a low affinity surface where the likelihood of, of, of meth being identified is much, much lower, you can get a bit of paper that says there's no problems when actually there's some significant problems within the property. And it's th those are the situations where people can get caught out. Yeah, okay. So sitting there at 1.5, clear process that was established. Labor government elected uh, in 2017 um, uh, and uh, in the midst of a housing crisis, um, shortage of property. Um, uh, and one of the first acts of the government was to commission uh, the then Chief Science Advisor to do another review of the same research that the ESR had done. Yep. Um, and six months later the report was published uh, and they came out with fundamentally different guidance. Uh, and that guidance was where it's use alone, uh, the level should be 10 times higher than the advice that came out of ESR. Right. Um, so, obviously, accompanied with the big media fanfare yep. um, uh, and advice that people shouldn't go about doing testing, um, which is essentially what they, uh, a lot of people chose not to do. It's yeah. going, well, we'll start ignoring the risk. Um, the issue that we've got is the risk hasn't gone away. Mm. Uh, and the, the problems, uh, if anything, have increased mm. and, and right. particularly have increased through the whole COVID yep. side of things. Yep. So where what we were seeing was a lot more importation of methamphetamine, a you know, huge bus or 500 kilogram mm. uh, bus, um, you know, the borders have closed down somewhat, That's so right. we're seeing a bit less of that and we're starting to see a bit more manufacture yeah. going on back within, uh, within property itself. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess where we're at right now right, is that the standard has not changed, that yeah. still sits there at 1.5. So for example, us as a service provider into the meth space, mm -hmm. and we're required to uh, do all of our health and safety around 1.5. Yeah. But uh, on the day that the Gluckman Meth Report was issued, Housing New Zealand changed its policy to rent out houses where levels were 15 and over. Right. Um, the Real Estate Authority, um, you know, they changed its uh, guidance through to um, real estate agents relatively shortly thereafter. Yeah. Uh, they had spent months going backwards and forwards as to whether they disclosed under or over 1.5, yeah. and then within days had made the decision to, to shift to 15. Yeah. Um, uh, and eventually the Tenancy Tribunal, so this came out in May or October, the Tenancy Tribunal, uh, they came, they made that shift to 15, shortly thereafter the lead adjudicator who'd made that uh, announcement right. um, resigned. So uh, we've now got this sort of sister situation where you kind of got a two speed um, uh, approach yeah. to these things. And I guess from an investor's point of view, what we've noticed is that at the time when um, properties are being sold, yep. um, low or no myth makes the sale really easy. Yep. Some yep. or lots of myth can make That's it really right. hard. Ab absolutely. <coughs> Some people uh, obviously investors uh, really try to take advantage of that if it is a high <laughs> high, high level. Not, not as many as we did see a few years ago, but we still had one just recently where they sort of took advantage of it a wee bit yep. and they really pushed the price down. And fair enough, it was a bad, bad problem sort of thing, so. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think that the, um, 
What's interesting is you're not seeing so much of it now. Well, you know, prior to that Gluckman Mess report coming out, 30% of sale and purchase agreements had subject to a satisfactory meth yeah. test, right? Yeah. That dropped to less than 5%. Yeah. But the proportion of positive results didn't change. Yeah. yeah. So all that meant was that there was a whole bunch of houses that were being transacted where the problem existed. It was just invisible, which is the nature of meth contamination, <coughs> yeah. and therefore transferred onto the new owner. Yeah. Now, the issue from an investor point of view is that if you've done your risk management um, uh, strategies properly, you've got insurance prior to your selling. Yeah. Uh, when you buy the property, you don't have insurance for pre-existing conditions. Yeah. Yeah. So if you haven't covered that off in terms of your conscious risk assessment process, you can end up um, taking on a property where you've done your numbers based on it's going to cost me this, mm -hmm. and then at some stage you find out there's a big issue, <laughs> yeah. and, the, and the cost can be significantly increased. Mm. And so the sort of issues that, that we see is where, because there's no problems with meth, right? Um, people have discounted it and so they will prep a property for sale, put a whole bunch of paint up on the walls uh, and then maybe somebody does a screening assessment, they find the problem and the problem is, is magnified by the painting redecoration work right? yeah, because it wasn't accounted right. for before that paint went up on the walls, yeah, it's, it's much much to, harder. Yeah. yeah, so you know a, a lot of the issues historically, so why do housing New Zealand spend so much money? Well they had a strategy, uh, a very conservative strategy around decontamination. Mm -hmm my estimation would be that they spent probably three times more than would have been the case right. if it was a private dwelling. So a private dwelling you would have decontaminated, you would have decontaminated your board and all that sort of carry on. Housing New Zealand was just stripping a whole bunch of material out. So that right. exacerbated mm. the, uh, the scale of the, uh, the problem itself. Um, but there's still some fundamentals that will trip people up, and, and redecoration is one so of them. So the stand, standard you're saying still one, is still 1.5, but um, yep. the Housing New Zealand, they, the government has said that they at 15, is that right? The yeah, so, so Housing New Zealand on the day that that Gluckman report came yeah. out, they adopted the level yeah. of 15 as being yeah, acceptable for, for their 10. So it's been there <coughs> for a wee while, but, but like I say, the standard hasn't changed. So now with uh, meth being a defined contaminant under the Residential Tenancies Act, if you yep. go to Tenancy Services and have a look on their website around the information that exists, yep. um, th that will talk about the fact that there's two ways in which you can measure what is or what is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, uh, and so it's no wonder there's a whole bunch of confusion. Yeah. Now what has been uh, talked about, and there's been some industry pundits who've, uh, who've, who've made this, uh, uh, you know, drawn attention to this, is that under the uh, Residential Tenancies Act uh, amendment, there was supposed to be some new numbers defined within the Residential Tenancies Act. Okay? Yeah. So that hasn't happened. Um, you know, the government will say, well, we've had more important things to do than, than address this particular uh, issue. Uh, and, and obviously they've got a lot going on on their plates as far as uh, COVID um, is concerned. But even whilst the numbers haven't been defined, you've still got a framework of reference around testing, which is the standard and the process that sits within that. Yep. And you've got precedent at the Tenancy Tribunal with the Tenancy Tribunal using 15 to determine damage. Mm. Okay. Um, so um, at the same time, you've got some insurers. So for example, if people have got a policy of insurance with an organization like Vero, the trigger for that policy will be 1.5, sorry, 15. Uh, micrograms, uh, which is the the, you know, the Gluckman number. Uh, other insurers have stayed with the standard. Yeah. Things like you know IEG Group, which is NZI State, they will trigger at 1.5. FMG will be another example of that. So you got two speed levels as far as assessing mm. a risk. You got two speed levels as far as you know transferring a risk to third parties is concerned. It's getting too hard. Everyone's saying it's all too hard. Let's go away. Do you know a, lo a <laughs> lot of people have? Um, but you know the fundamentals haven't changed, and and it doesn't matter who it is. Yeah. Um, and whilst there may be dif differences of opinion around the number, um, what we do know is that at, at a point, uh, meth residues in property become problematic from mm. a health, safety and well-being point of view. Yeah. So it's a real risk yeah. as far as the property itself is, is concerned. I was going to say to you, if, um, a house, if you're looking at buying a house and it does have meth, what are your options? But I think even before that question, it goes to the point that um, well, you know, what you're just saying there is you, um, if you're looking at buying a house, Firstly, get it checked to see what level of meth it has got. Yeah. Then, then you know what it is, um, and, uh, and and that'll decide, I guess, on what options you're going to do from then. Because yeah. it's um, and it depends on almost where you are and what you're doing with the property. Uh, yeah. Is it going to be housing New Zealand property you're buying? Is it is it is it not? Is it you know, is, is so many variables yeah. sort, of, sort of thing. So um, so, so the challenge with. Um, that is, is we've been in business now for uh, nearly nine years. Um, we've been involved with Sambly over 20,000 properties. Yep. 
uh, and, and if every low risk scenario that you can think of, we've come across properties that have cut across that. You know? yeah. So the property that's been in the same family for the last 50 years, mum and dad are living there, um, owner occupied, you know, old people in their 90s, yeah. uh, shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and then people have bought those houses, and then the neighbours have popped around, and then, oh, did you hear about the son in his bloody 60s uh, who was on home detention for meth-related charges, meth test, bunch of meth that sits within <laughs> the property. Now, I, I mean, I guess the message that we say is like, you make a conscious assessment of the risk. Mm. Don't just ignore it. I think you talked earlier about, uh, when we were talking before, about the presence of the toxicology clause in there. That's in there as a reminder. Um, so before you take it out, make a conscious assessment of that yeah. risk. That's a good news, and not a, not many of you, um, some of you will even realise now. The latest uh, uh, edition of the sale and purchase agreement that came out does have that clause yeah. in there on the front page, just by the finance, just by the builder's report and the yep. one, his toxicology report. So um, yet something there, and you should be seriously looking at yes or no, and then Correct. it relates to the clauses in the, in the, yeah. sub, in, in the um, small print in the, in the contract. Uh, but it's there for a good reason. It's there because the, everyone thinks it's important enough. To be sure. on the front page like the building report yeah. so um that you shouldn't it shouldn't be just crossed out yep. fully nitty without actually thinking about it yeah and, yeah. I, and I think that the what we encourage people to do is uh, I mean the only way to know for sure right is to to do a test because yeah. it's an invisible risk um but but before you make that decision to get a test done do a conscious assessment of the risk itself you know so what is the history of the property is it rental you know, yeah your likelihood yeah. just goes up um you know, what are the people like, what are the visual signals that are coming off the people, what's the reasons in there behind selling, and then from your perspective, what amount of meth are you happy with within mm. the property or prepared to accept, yep. okay, because if it's none, um, uh, you know, or some, then that will have a different impact in terms of what you do and how you do it. Mm. And then, you know, how are you going to manage and mitigate that risk? So for example, if you buy the property without getting it tested and finally got an issue, how are you going to pay for that because you haven't got cover mm. and response to insurance? If it's done through the sale and purchase process, most um, vendors who manage their properties uh, effectively uh, will have recourse to insurance. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's how you minimise the impact to uh, everybody uh, concerned. So look, in an ideal world, let's say you're selling a property as an investor, if you know what it is before you take it to market, you mm -hmm. don't get caught out. If yeah. you know what it is before you put paint on the walls, you're not going to get caught out. Yeah. Because what we know is that if that sale and purchase process is going on, a bit of meth is found within a property, even if it's very low level, it can create uncertainty. Yeah. That uncertainty, you know, from your experience as a, as a real estate salesperson and yeah. agent, right? What does uncertainty do to a sale and purchase process? Yeah, it just makes, it, it makes the price go down. Oh, um, yeah, Either it goes down or yeah, it kills the sale dead, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's an absolute pain for, uh, for all concerned. So if we know what we're dealing with, mm. options are take on board the risk, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the more information that you have in terms of uh, how much meth distribution through the property, uh, uh, what's it, what it's going to cost to fix, mm -hmm. the better able you are to estimate that risk um, and, and manage it accordingly. From a personal point of view, because there are so many variables that are involved and because most vendors would have access to insurance, my view is uh, that you're better off getting the issue resolved. Um, it gives you less opportunity to um, leverage the sale mm -hmm. all right? and some people are quite happy to go in there and leverage like hell mm. um, but you know from our perspective as an organization what we're trying to do is reduce the impact that this sort of stuff has so how do you create an equitable uh, outcome well you know, resolve the problem and then buy the problem resolved uh, yeah. is, uh, is a really good way uh, of dealing with that uh, we still do see um, people so if there's a lot of methods in a screening assessment generally the people who you're reducing the number of prospective purchases so mm -hmm. you've captured sort of that, that bidding marketing that can go on uh, within yep. that. Uh, and often you look at discounted yeah. um, uh, rates on the back end of it as well. Yeah, I think it's still um, well worth finding any issues out beforehand as a vendor when you're about to sell. Uh, it's like anything, it's a leaky home, you know, or potential leaky homes, yep. made a monoclinic clinic cleaning, get a report done, and it shows you've actually taken the, taken the time before you sell it to have a look. I remember selling um, in Law's Place in St. Helens several years ago, and uh, that was a monoclinic cleaning. Well, we got a report, it had two parts of the property that had um, you know, reasonably high readings and that, yeah. was, that was all. But we declared that and the buyers actually saw that and went, okay, I'm actually okay, well, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. They got their builder in, so uh, I think yeah. that's better rather than finding something and then, and then the event, the purchase go, well, what else are they hiding? Yeah, yeah, And yeah. then I'm not yeah. going to pay as much as, it, as it you were. Yeah. Where if you get it, if you're, you're trying to take away every reason for people not to want to buy your property yeah. when you're a vendor. Um, so, you know, hit any issues up front. 
make it make it a turn around to be a positive sort of thing. Oh, look, and, and, and so one of the this things is a great example of that. Yeah, one of the things that we try, do to try and support that part of the process, mate, right, is that um, we, we can do uh, a test on behalf of a vendor. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons I believe that it sits in the sale and purchase contract that purchasers should get their own test done is so that they can then legally rely on that report because it's in their name. Yeah. Okay. So what we will do uh, is, um, from a, a, a vendor's perspective, is we will transfer that report into the name of the purchaser. There's an administration fee that's associated yeah. with that. Yeah. So rather than having no multiple bloody meth tests being done, yeah, yeah, put that into the name of the purchaser, then the purchaser can legally rely on right. that side of things. We're, we're happy to do that because our process is consistent. It doesn't matter whether it's the purchaser or the vendor or the tenant that is asking for it to be done. It's the same process yeah. that we, we go through. Mm -hmm. um, and then that way your uh, vendor has got control of the information. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've just seen a, a, a case uh, recently um, where a screening assessment was done by another company um, uh, on behalf of a purchaser. Uh, the purchaser made an offer of uh, with a $50,000 discount over the um, original uh, asking price. Yeah. Uh, the vendor wasn't happy with that uh, and then subsequently and shortly thereafter they get a call from the council saying we've been advised um, mm. that you've got meth in your property over right. a certain point, right? So because they don't control mm -hmm. that information, that's the sort of behaviour that unscrupulous people will uh, yeah. engage with is shipping it off to, uh, to council. Mm. So being able to control the process from a vendor's point of view is in my opinion, smart. It yep. may not be what you uh, want to hear, all right? Yep. Um, but in, in, in terms of mitigating that risk that the whole sale and purchase process get de derailed, uh, uh, it, it's, it's smart. Yeah, okay? so I think I'm right in saying with, um, with meth is if there is a proven level above the standard, substantially above the standard, has been proven you can send the council and they can put that on the on the file and can put it on a limb to say this mm. problem has, property has got it and it will sit there until someone actually goes back to them usually and, 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 and identifies some sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, so generally the only way that that happens uh, is if the police get involved and the police believe that manufacture has occurred. Oh, okay. 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 Um, but if a disenfranchised party sends a copy of a report off to council, that's, so yeah. therefore there's evidence that, that this property there's an issue, yeah. and generally yeah. council will uh, will, oh, will get involved with that sort of thing. Yeah. And it can trip um, people up, uh, okay. that's the unfortunate reality of that. Right, so when should people uh, look at get, getting testing done, obviously when they're, when they're selling, and obviously when they're, yep. when they're buying, uh, every time they're buying, What's your opinion, and when else should people uh, get testing done? Yeah, so look, I think that the, the sale and purchase, um, y you need to consider the risk, is the reality of it, right? So yeah. if, for example, you are, you've, you've got the family home, you've lived in the family home for ages, um, there's no health and safety issues associated with being in the family home, and now you've bought another house and you've become the landlord on that basis. Yeah. Um, do you need it to do it as, as or sorry, if you're going to sell it, would you need to worry as a vendor? No, would you need to worry about it as a purchaser, potentially? Mm. Okay, you need to make that considered uh, opinion. Yep. Um, in, in the context of risk management, right now, because meth is a defined contaminant under that Residential Tenancies Act, and there's a clearer process uh, around consequence, what I'm anticipating that we're going to see, and particularly if the numbers come back, mm -hmm. right, and I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit um, in, the, in a moment, uh, but because it's a framework of conf uh, consequence, the people who tend to know most about what meth contamination is in a property yep. are the people who are responsible for that meth contamination. <laughs> yeah. right? And those people have generally got expensive habits that try and service one way or the other. Uh, and so if they can find a way of getting some cash out of the landlord right, yeah. because the landlord's rented out a property that isn't fit for them to live in because there was no evidence of what it was before they moved in uh, they will do so right? yeah. and we've seen that happen uh, on more than one, you know, right. one, one, one occasion so you can have a landlord who believes with every fiber of their being that it is those individuals who are responsible for the contamination of their property yeah. but if they haven't got the test before they've moved in uh, it can be bloody hard yeah. to prove it and what yeah. we're seeing with the tenancy tribunal uh, and for people who've been through the tribunal it's variable depending on who the adjudicator is right um it is that the test once there's meth in there is that much higher but yeah. if you can produce a report that says on this day in these areas there was nothing and on this day in these areas there was something, something yeah. you've got clear irrefutable evidence yeah. um, of the fact that some meth related behavior has occurred so even if you uh, even though at this stage the tenancy tribunals are working to 15 for damage yeah. um, for the time being right until such time as we go down the decriminalization route 
use of methamphetamine is still illegal. Mm -hmm. So you can get uh, people identified for illegal acts, which will then cover the, um, the excess on your policy of insurance, and you can generally pick up some exemplary damages as well. Right. The significant thing, though, of doing that test before people move in is that as long as it's part of your communication to prospective tenants that that's what you're doing, yep. because you're creating that framework of reference and therefore framework of consequence, yep. you're less likely to get the behaviour. Yeah. Okay? And, and you know, the trigger for the cost and expense is, is whatever the number that's determined, right? Yeah, so at the moment right. it's this, this 15. Um, or if you're selling, it's generally going to be uh, less. But the right. issue with methamphetamine is the behaviours, and you see that reported in the media every day. Yeah. And so from a landlord's perspective, if you've got somebody with a meth habit, to start off with, you might not notice anything. Mm. But generally what you'll see is deterioration of behaviours. Um, yeah, rent doesn't get paid um, because the pipe is more important than you know, yeah. <laughs> even feeding the kids. Yeah. Um, you can start to see an increase in antisocial behaviour. Uh, and you can start to see an increase in damage to the property itself. Yeah. So it's much, much more than just about health and safety. The health and safety is the trigger for, um, you know, for action as far as you know, the contaminant is concerned. It's all the other things that go with methamphetamine that yeah. you really want to be able to avoid. So you know, testing in between tenancies, testing on cause. Yeah, I was going to say that where that's uh, another time that uh, in the ideal world you would always do it between tenancies. but. For sure. Not, not everyone can or can afford to, or again, it's that risk assessment, I guess, of who's been there, yep. who's, who's coming in. Well, if, if, you, you, know if, you, really. if you're looking at sort of costs around testing, so in, in round numbers, um, most properties are going to be looking about sort of 300 bucks. Yep. So unless you're churning tenants on a, you know, yeah. a, a short-term um, basis, um, you know, that $300 is you know, tax deductible. Yeah. So now we're back to you know, just over a couple of hundred. It's only a year, every year or two years. It's not. It's a, it's a pretty good investment to invest it, in. It, it's a it's a small way of mm. reducing that risk, which is real. All right. So you know when we sort of are testing properties, we're still seeing around forty percent of properties that have got a bit of methane. Right. So that's not problematic from a health and safety point of view, but it's symptomatic of how widespread it is. Yeah. Um, uh, and we even with those Gluckman numbers of 15, yep. you know, we're still seeing sort of one to two percent of what we're doing is exceeding those Isn't sorts that? of levels. Right. About 10 percent goes past your 1.5, yep. um, and an increasing number of people who, because of that toxicology clause, are starting to get those tests done as part of the sale and purchase process. Yep. Um, so, so if anything, the issue is going to come back into focus. And I think I mentioned around the, you know, the numbers and what happens with the numbers. The, the, the shift to 15 was sustainable because there was no evidence of people being affected at those yep. lower levels. What wasn't clearly articulated was the definition that was put around evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, independently peer-reviewed um, scientific papers in um, reputable uh, publications. since the Gluckman Meth Report was put together because there wasn't any evidence on that basis at yep. that time. There is now evidence of that. So okay. it's still limited, um, but in the context of, um, of, of scientific evidence, what that's saying is that some people, and there was a lot of anecdotal stuff around it, mm. some people do have adverse health reactions at low levels. Right. So yeah. you're now in the sort of situation where, well, well what do we do with that? Mm. Um, and so this is the challenge that, the, the, that sits with MB um, is we've now got new evidence um, that meets the definition yep. that says that there are issues at low levels. Um, and some of the reasons that sit in behind that is other research that says, okay, well, when you're in a house that's got a meth history and, and you know, people who have been in properties where there's been significant meth related behavior will be able to relate to this, is that you might not be touching lots of services so that you can come out with a bloody headache, mm. uh, feeling a little bit all over the place, a little bit mismothered and yeah. generally feeling quite rubbish. Yeah. All right? So how is it that that happens if you're not touching lots of services? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is because some of that meth is getting revalidalized into um, the air and we're literally, we're breathing, breathing it in. in. All right? So that's why it becomes a, a, a problem. And, and I know that I you know, personally, I've received a lot of criticism from a lot of different people for, yeah. for sort of dealing with this, but, but you know, we deal with uh, people who found themselves in these positions on, on, uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and the challenge is that it isn't being measured. Yeah. All right. So um, what would have been ideal on the back of Gluckman is to say, okay, well, we believe it's this number. Yeah. It was mentioned that more research needed to be done, but I'm not aware of any research that's been done and any measure that's been put yeah. in around that, yeah. which then creates the, the bigger body of evidence that yeah. gives that you know, confidence in decision-making um, you know, either way. So it'll be interesting to see what happens through this year mm. uh, uh, around the numbers. Yeah. Um, but sustaining 15, you're going to have to ignore the real-world evidence yeah, um, right. that uh, that is new to the table, 
since that report was produced. Mm. That'll be interesting what happens there. Just, yeah, just well, one thing with the, um, and with some uh, listeners today and watchers will be, like I was, I think might have been the first time we spoke about it, I was sort of surprised with uh, these meth around any, anyway sort of thing, level, certain levels, yep. I mean, you're talking about a $20 bill or a, you, you get given some money from a shop that's been going around, you know, going yep. around, there's, there's some level of, of, yep. of uh, you know, meth on, on that sort of thing. Which, um, that, so, so, you know, we, we're, how aware is the meth around? You know, I mean, how, yeah, how, so much, how much is that there we don't even know that we're touching every day? Oh, yeah, <laughs> heaps. And, and I think that the reality is that the meth on money side of things is quite interesting. So, you know, most um, dealers don't have FBOS. Yeah, that's right. right? So <laughs> it, it's going to be cash based. Um, yeah. And this is transferable um, between those, those side of things. So, yes, there's a lot in there. Um, the, the issue with meth in, um, on, on money is it sits in our wallets, in our pockets. And yeah. we interact with it very little. When you're talking about inside of a uh, of a property, it's on and in all of the services. So again, there's been more research that's been done uh, around how meth uh, interacts with different services, right? So some it soaks into, yeah. um, right. uh, and others it will sit on top of, yeah. just depending on the uh, on the material type. And it depends on the levels as well. When you go to clean it, you have to replace some things, and some you can clean it. And it depends on that. Yep. I guess the same yeah, thing. Yeah, and, and look, replacement doesn't happen that often. Yeah these days is the reality of it because yeah. the decontamination contractors have become much better at what they do yeah. if they get really good information yeah yeah they will do fixed price quoting yeah. to uh, say look we will resolve it uh, and it's it's the exception rather than the rule to physically remove you know materials yeah. other than things like you know doors so hollow core doors will blow out in terms of the decontamination process and yeah. the damage and therefore need to be replaced on the back end but so it's that sort of thing yeah. but if you imagine that you if you took those twenty dollar bills that have got meth in and now plaster them all over the inside of your room mm. yeah so now they're in a <laughs> exposed environment that meth that's on it some of it will volatilize yeah. off uh, and and from a meth user's point of view it's bugger all mm. but for somebody who doesn't have the meth habit yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean if we can remember back to that first drink of alcohol we might have been on our ear with half a pint <laughs> of beer right yeah um, now we can probably sustain a couple more glasses yeah. of red um, but for the for, for people who don't have a meth habit even low levels yeah. can trigger yeah, those responses so again what the research is saying is that if you're in a house with low levels uh, of meth contamination even just above uh, the New Zealand standard or there or thereabouts some people will respond mm, to that maybe. with issues like sleeplessness and behavior issues in uh, in kids yep. uh, some skin issues eye irritation that sort of carry on right okay mm -hmm. um, uh, and and um, you know over time those issues get exacerbated yeah. and they're generally more for somebody who's a little bit more sensitized but yeah. you know you and I both know people who are more sensitive yeah. than others you may yeah. be a bit more sensitive <laughs> yourself Mark, right but but, not. but that's yeah, what we're dealing with <laughs> yeah no, that's all good and just just a note for um, uh, if you're looking at buying a house and, and you think, geez, how do I find out if there has been any meth without me doing a meth test or, or whatever, is um, ask the question, ask the agent the question. 100%. If it's uh, if it's not to, if, if, and remember it's only what the agent knows, and so if you don't say anything and the agent doesn't know, they're not gonna say anything, if the agent knows it's had a meth test and it's below the level of one and a half, 1.5, we don't have to tell, disclose anything because it's below that level recommended level in New Zealand. But just, just on that, mate, yeah. I mean, the, the actually the advice that came out of the Real Estate Authority shortly after the issuance of the Gluckman report was that if the real estate agent, uh, if, if, they, if there's meth present, yeah. but it's lower than 15 micrograms in any one area sampled, yeah. right, then the agent doesn't have to disclose yeah. that unless yeah. the purchaser has, has actually specifically uh, requested. Yeah. So it's even, it's at a much, so much you're higher. you're 15 now. 15, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, from, so, for, for, so there could be Quite a bit of meth in there, yeah. relative to the standard, yeah. but less than 15, and you won't be told about it unless yeah. uh, you ask the agent about knows it. about it. We definitely will disclose. In fact, I still thought it was 1.5, so that's there we go. So that w w I'm going to do a job in 15. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so, so looking yes, after so people's interests. Yes, absolutely. So the moral of the story is, if you ask the question, it doesn't matter if it's had a meth test and there's 0 0.0001, we will will tell you that it's had that. Um, so you know, it's up to yeah. you as a buyer. To ask, it, ask the agent a question every time, ask a question, yeah. just ask it. Hey, do you know it's had a meth test done? Yes, yeah. no, easy. So again, some do and some don't. And and I'll give you an example of one situation where we had a real estate professional buying a house. Yeah. Um, and um, they, as part of their sort of inquiry, had said, look, is there anything else that I need to know about? Mm. Right. So yep. from their perspective, that was a catch-all question that included right. methamphetamine, oh, okay. right? Yep. Didn't specifically reference methamphetamine. Yeah. The 
a vendor had had some testing done. They knew there was some meth present, but knew that it was less than the 15. Mm -hmm. right? The real estate agent knew that it was less than the 15, so therefore there's nothing else that they needed to know Close, about, yeah. so it wasn't disclosed. Okay, So now, um, as we've gone unconditional, yeah. and now the purchaser finds out that there is an issue as far as meth in the property is concerned, but at levels that are within the yeah, yeah, yeah. recommended, uh, yeah. even recommended by the standard, they've, they've gone to that level and extent, but from the purchaser's point of view, now they, they were buying a house they didn't think had meth in, and then they find out that they've got a house that's got a bit of meth in, and yeah. they're not happy with that, right? right? Because yeah. it's kind of like, well, I didn't want any yeah. in the property at all. And so this is, even real estate professionals can get caught mm. out um, yeah. by uh, this sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, to your point, ask the question. Yeah. You know, what's the meth status of the property? Uh, what's the meth history of the property? What meth testing has been done on here? Yeah. Um, and then depending on the sort of reports that you get, um, you may need to ask more questions. So, for example, a screening assessment is a is a is is if there's no issues, that's where it will stop and start. Right. So, a screening assessment is you've got your field composite samples grouped together. You'll get totals for groups of samples. Mm -hmm. There's another approach which is the lab composite. Okay. So, individual samples that get analysed as a group. Right. So, anywhere you see a report that's got groups of samples together and low levels or no levels of meth, yeah, you can be comfortable that there's no problems. Anywhere that you see a report that's got individual samples, okay, yeah. the only reason you spend the money to get the individual samples is if you've been trying to address a more right. significant issue. Right. Okay? okay, And under those circumstances, we, we would always recommend that you do a little bit more inquiry. Uh, yeah, we, we have people approach us with, look, I've got this report, what do you think? An yeah. um, uh, example of that yeah, recently was um, a client who bought two properties on the same title. Um, uh, one report was a screening assessment mm -hmm. from one company. Another report was individual samples from a different company. Right. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, and and uh, they just took it at face value. Looked at the numbers. Not a problem. Not a problem. Yeah. Purchased the property. Moved on. Uh, and then gone through a bit of a process around um, uh, screening assessments. Uh, and because the the job's been done properly now not taken off the middle of walls, but off the high risk services that the standard <laughs> says you should use, yeah. all of a sudden there's a, a little bit of a problem. So not a major, but again, different from what people were expecting yeah. uh, and, and, and like really frustrating. Right? So one of the harms that comes out of meth uh, is when people feel like they've been caught out. Yeah. And then you've got a situation where decent people um, are feeling aggrieved. Um, they're looking around for somebody to hold responsible. And generally the finger ends up pointing at the man sitting or the woman sitting Absolutely. in the middle, right? And, yeah. and, and here we are with this bloody invisible risk that uh, <laughs> is a consequence of illegal behavior. Yeah. Um, uh, and yet it's, it's so easy. Yeah. It's so easy to rule it out as an issue. Uh, and compared to the value of houses, it's cheap to do. Yeah, okay. Absolutely, no, that's, um, that's, that's good, uh, good advice there for people. Um, we'll wrap up soon, but just a, couple, just a couple of things to finish up on is I remember for different people in the industry, I guess, or industry players, of um, whether different testers, but also, I mean, when this thing first started six or four or five years ago, and you alluded to it before, um, there were well, there were a lot of dodgy players out there, we'll say, and, and yeah. what, I, what I mean by for people listening, dodgy players, people would say they'd have their testing regime or whatever. It may or may not be the same company. What I like about you is you test, you don't you don't go and fix, so you're not going you're not yeah. going to see someone off going this is bad and you go and fix it when there might be nothing to fix sort of Correct. thing. Yeah, that, yeah. that sort of stuff was going on in the industry. Oh, and there's still and people out there who will do that. Yeah, and I was going to say, yeah, how bad is that now considering what, what was out there you know, four years ago? Yeah. Is, is so, it, so not as bad. Yeah, right. not as so bad. not as bad, right? <laughs> so so um, if you can think of one of the upsides of, uh, of, of Gluckman is that it, it cut a sway through um, testing and decontamination contractors. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Business literally got cut in half overnight. Yeah. Um, the risk didn't change, um, and the reality of the risk didn't change, but the perceptions of the risk did. Yeah. Uh, and so business being cut in half meant that a, a lot of people who had been speculative in terms of why they got into it mm -hmm. um, have got now gone from the uh, from the market. Um, the people who are left are people who recognise the reality of that risk, uh, and who want to uh, provide services. Um, that really mean that people don't get caught out yeah, by yeah. the uh, by the problem, right? So, um, in, in terms of making an assessment, you know, how long have people been around? What's the process that they follow? 
um, you know, if you're still uncertain, you know, is there anybody that they can refer them into? You know, that sort of carry on. Yeah. Um, we don't do the decontamination work, but again, we've seen people do really good, consistent work over a period of yeah. time. Yeah. It doesn't mean to say that they get it right 100% of the time because yeah. there's still those problematic properties out there that have got really difficult to clean materials um, within them. But, you know, nine times out of 10, it's, it's really sorted out first time and, uh, and done well. Mm. Um, no financial tie up. Yeah. Uh, it's something that we do to try and get people through that process more quickly because all the time you're dealing with the uncertainty of a meth affected property, it's bloody painful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, the, and time is one of the things that, uh, that can be controlled. Mm. Um, so again, yeah, what's their process? How long have they been around? Um, yeah, what, what kind of guarantees do they give you around um, performance? Mm. Yeah, that's like any, any professional in any industry, you, you're a good and bad operators and you, you do your research to try to find it out. Oh, yeah. History is the biggest, for biggest sure. thing. Yeah, for sure. And look, I mean, uh, yeah, I acknowledge that there are people out there who've report, re received reports from ourselves that aren't the ones that they want. Yeah. Uh, and they might go to a, another testing company and get the report that they want. Um, my view is that if a report doesn't reflect the worst case reality of the meth contamination in the property, yeah. then it's not the report that people need right. um, because you can miss stuff. And then that missed stuff can have this knock-on effect as far as health, safety, yeah. and well-being is concerned, which is documented in in real-world research. Um, so you know, it's not about trying to cut corners; it's about trying to get to that end result where we know that the issue has been quantified and it's not going to create a problem for anybody as quickly as possible for as low a cost right. uh, as possible. It doesn't mean the cheapest. Yeah, 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 as low a cost as possible yeah. with giving people certainty. Hundred percent. Jolly good. Well, this is a property podcast. So I will, I will ask. I'm going to ask every guest this year what they think about the property market, or, or not necessarily the property market. Maybe something that they've seen themselves in the, in the property at the moment. Have you got any uh, anything you want to wrap, wrap up with there oh, yourself look, yeah, so away from meth testing? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it, I hate to say it, but it does link a little bit back into uh, into that side of things. So, so yep. what we've seen is the toxicology clause in the sale and purchase agreement means yep. that more right. people are thinking about meth. Uh, the heat in the property market, because um, you know, clearly it's, it's, it has been red hot, mm -hmm. means that it is one of the conditions that uh, that people will um, drop in order to get, get in there. Right. So, you know, for, for vendors who've got a property that have got some concerns about, they might want to flip the coin on that. I wouldn't recommend it, but but we know that some do. Mm -hmm. uh, purchases, uh, again, if you're going into that market and you're not consciously considering this risk, you truly are flipping the coin on what can be tens of thousands of, uh, of dollars mm. uh, and for a few hundred bucks you can resolve that. And how quick, now, just for the toxicology report, I mean how, um, how quick can you turn a report around, you do it in five working days? Oh, look, we, we can, um, subject to the, the courier doing their job, um, we can get it turned around in 48 hours right. if people really need it to be done that quickly. Yeah. Generally, um, people will look to do it within three days. Um, we've got sort of three service levels that we, uh, that we okay. work to, but certainly on the five day um, uh, working side of things, or five right. working day business, uh, then we could get into that. What's been quite interesting uh, is that with the recent COVID uh, lockdown, a lot of the sales transition onto online auctioning, yeah, um, yeah. And, and some of those COVID restrictions make completion of due diligence a little bit uh, mm, challenging. So you know, there's a few sort of tricky things that get played around that as, yeah. uh, as well. I suppose you could still have a clean contract, even just if you want to go unconditional, just have subject to that store. It's almost unconditional unless, you know, maybe if they find something wrong, you've got, you guys find something wrong with the... Uh, so th there's ways of, of protecting it. it. Yeah, yeah. But like, I, I think that um, the issues with methamphetamine in New Zealand haven't changed, they're not going to change um, yeah. anytime soon. Um, doesn't mean say you have to go and test every property, but it does mean that you have to consciously assess the risk before you make any decision mm. um, to invest. To your point, ask the questions of the real estate agent, try and flush that out, see if there's anything that's been going on. Um, be aware that there's some, there can be some also tricky bits within you know, test reports, so yep. if you're provided with them and you want a, a point of reference, if they're one of ours, give us a ring. Uh, if there's somebody else's, give us a ring and look, we're happy to provide you a bit of context around right. uh, that side of things as well. Okay, just uh, finish off, what, what's the uh, best way to contact? Um Miles at Meth Solutions. Miles at Meth Solutions. Well, yeah, so it's the team. <laughs> uh, 0800 638 That's 0800 638 uh, And we've still got our head office team who can provide you with support, uh, whatever issue it is that you're dealing with with Meth. Great stuff. Well, thank you, Miles. Thanks very much My for your pleasure, time mate. today. And thanks to your listeners uh, watching and listening to us. And we'll be uh, back in two weeks with another special guest like Miles. And, awesome. And enjoy your time, man. Thank God we're out of... Uh, Level three. Yeah, at a level three. Otherwise, we wouldn't be this close. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, take care. Cheers.